the person texted in, I am attending the conference with my wife as a last ditch effort to salvage my 30 years of marriage. Divorce papers have been served. What would you say, Jerry? Oh my. I would say that right now this couple is in so much pain that they feel the only way to escape that pain is divorce. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that that is Satan's lie. Mm -hmm. That you escape one kind of pain, but you jump into another. Mm -hmm. And when you remain in the pain of a hard marriage, there is always hope. Because God mm -hmm. is the God of hope. He breathes life into dead people. Yeah. <laughs> he breathes love into dead marriages. Um, it, it makes me think of Isaiah uh, 41. Um, 17 and 18. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, this couple is dying, right? They're shriveled up. I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of valleys. That's what God can do for this couple. So I would say, if your pastor is here, seek him out. Be honest with him. Get with your elders. Ask for help. Do not give up yet. God can save this marriage. Yes. Um, and here's not as profound and wonderful as that something, but my, it might help. A change of strategy. Let me just speak to all of us husbands. Have you ever tried to convince your wife what a failure she is, and you found that that worked? That helped? <laughs> Um, every husband here, every wife here, has failed in many ways. I have. Why not take a different approach? Why not talk to your wife about what a failure you are? Why not say, honey, let, let's change the subject. I have been so angry at you, <clears throat> I have been so offended, and I have been so judgmental, and I have trotted out in my own mind and in, in between the two of us this disappointment about you, this betrayal in you, this failure in you. I don't want to talk about that anymore. In a way, I really hate doing this, but in honesty, The gospel invites me and calls me to, could I tell you every reason why I think you should divorce me? Every reason why I wouldn't blame you. Every reason even I can see why it's hard to live with me. For example, for starters, see, the Bible says, but if we walk in the light, in the place of honesty. In the context, we know that's what walking in the light is. Honesty. About ourselves. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, that's where God is. Not in the shadows of denial and evasion. He's out there in the light. If you're having a hard time connecting with God, you're wondering, whatever happened to God? Why is God so far from me? It's because you're back in the shadows of denial. Just step out into the light. It's where he is. He's not hard to find. The more honest you are, the more real God will be. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, two things happen. One, we have fellowship with one another. Sympathy flows. We find out how much we have in common. We find out even what we're willing to forgive. 
second thing that happens. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's where the blood comes down. That's where the cleansing comes down. That's where the power comes down. The past you can't erase. That you wish weren't there. The blood of Jesus can wash it away. But you've got to change your approach. Instead of going into attack mode on her or him. Say, honey, I don't blame you for... I, if you hated me, I wouldn't blame you. I can see reasons why a reasonable person looking at me would be deeply offended. So let me step around and take your side against myself. And let's see what God will do with that. So before God and before you, let me give you some reasons why I wouldn't blame you for divorcing me. And then turn it around. Have the conversation the other way. Now, if you can't have a two-way conversation like that, it's, you know, that's tough. But if you could have that conversation, a week from today, your marriage will be different. May God help. Next one. Janie, what do you think submission looks like when you know that your husband is wrong? <laughs> she, she's an expert. This probably never happened, though. Much experience. 43 years of living with that experience. Oh, really? <laughs> so wrong, so bad. You promised me you wouldn't badmouth yourself all night. Um, <laughs> What submission would look like if that ever happened in our marriage? Um, be an honest conversation of, honey, I'm, I, I really think you're wrong in this, and it scares me. And here's why I think you're wrong, and I'm going to try not to cry when I tell you, so that you know there can be actual talking and not yeah, just... That really that freaks point. me out when she <laughs> calls. <laughs> so, um, so I would tell him honestly why I think he's wrong. And then I would say, but God is asking me to submit to you. So no matter what, I'm going to, and if you carry on in this direction, as long as it's not illegal, you know he's not. But if it's something that you think like moving to Scotland for your PhD. Um, it could be harmful to the family. I'm all in because I'm your wife. And God has called me to submit to you. God has allowed you to want to do this. God has brought us to this point. So he has something for me to learn as well as you. Could I add to that? Please. May I add a Absolutely. Um, here, here is one of the low points of my uh, performance as a husband. We were seven years in. <laughs> Why do you do this? We were seven years in, and um, I was, I loved my wife and my little ch kids. I really did, but I was also selfish more than I e even realized. And I was really vigorously involved in some very exciting uh, relationships in, in ministry, not with women, with, with guys. I mean, we were just having, a, we were building out a new ministry. It was very exciting. And I found, uh, I found too much emotional enjoyment and relational satisfaction there. And I wasn't bringing home enough for her and the children. But I didn't know it because I was clueless and selfish. <coughs> And I don't know if you remember this, but we had a conversation. And without berating me, without scolding me, without demeaning me, without demanding, without threats, none of that stuff, she gently, meekly, respectfully said to me, honey, the children and I will always love you. We're not sure we're always going to have you. And that got my attention. If she had tried to bully me or shame me, I would have just become defensive and withdrawn and 
become indignant. And, but she was so gentle and respectful, it just broke my heart. I mean, it worked. And that was a turning point in our marriage. That was, that was when I think I actually got married. <laughs> you know, well, that wasn't my idea. That was St. Peter's idea. First Peter 3. <clears throat> Ladies, you can win your husband without a word. Powerful. A respectful wife really yeah. helps. I couldn't resist what she was saying. I knew it was true. And she didn't offend me in communicating it to me. And she flew in under the radar of my pride. Kaboom. It's great. Huge blessing. That was a sanctified. You know, isn't it great? Um, God gives us the privilege of marriage as a massively sanctifying experience. Mm -hmm. And he throws in sex to boot. <laughs> that is so sweet. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs>
that that's, I think, might also be part yeah. of this question. Would yeah. you like to speak to well, that? Well, that is more complicated. That is more delicate. And there, there the problem is not the sin. The problem is trust. The problem is trust. Am I married to a person who is <coughs> sincere in his or her statements to me? Can I trust this person? And uh, that, by God's grace, let's never do anything to erode trust. Let's always build trust. And if that's, okay, if it's a trust issue, honey, it's, if it's a sin at that level of magnitude and impact and harm, with repeated protests of, oh, I'm so sorry, and I, it won't happen again, and I'm just, what would you say then, darling? I would say um, that this man and woman need to get help together within the church. Go to your pastor, go to an elder, someone answer. you trust. Yeah. Get a um, support group around you of at least one other couple where there's a woman yeah. and a man together. Yeah. and to have daily or weekly accountability over the next two to three years yeah. and see where you end up there. Because yeah. usually repetitive behavior along the nature that we're hinting at is addictive. And it takes a long time to break an addiction yeah. like that, just even chemically and physically. Yeah. And here's on the other side, at the same time, I'm totally agreeing with everything you're saying. I'm saying to the spouse of the, in that difficulty, God is giving you the privilege of being an agent of powerful redemption in the life of a needy human being. That might not be what you signed up for, but all of us end up in relationships like that where it's very costly. Redemption is costly, yes. He sees that cost, and yeah. he will reward you for it. Yeah. It was one other thing I wanted to say. Um, We Christians live on a starvation diet of community. We, we barely know how to do community. We think we do. But we need to be in each other's lives in gentle, respectful, non-shaming, non-dominating, humble, accessible ways such that our lives in this kind of moment, there are relationships in your world where your life can flow into the lives of other people who are wiser and just a little further down the road in a way that might just rescue your whole life. Mm -hmm. You need to walk in the light with them too. And you'll find fellowship in the blood of Jesus. Right there. But, um, the what we typically settle for in terms of community will not help you. You've got to go deeper. Open your life up as never before. Next. What am I supposed to do when I don't feel like my wife is a helper and I don't feel accepted by my wife, especially when I have been vulnerable with her? I mean, that could be a real problem. Oh, huge. Huge. I mean, that isn't necessarily a wrong reaction. It, it might be, but let's, let's assume that that's a, a legitimate assessment of what's happening there. Yes, okay? yes, where the wife is not supportive, respectful, helpful yeah. towards the husband. Yeah. Well, there have been times when I've been like that. You keep saying that. I don't know why. You, I, I don't just, I just don't see it that way at all. Have the worst drive home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, honey. Okay, well, let's get back to the question. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to a wife who, I don't know, maybe she feels fed up, you know? Maybe she doesn't respect her husband anymore. Uh, maybe she's, you know, lost some of her regard for him. Maybe she's looking at another man thinking, well, why didn't I choose him? What what would help a young woman who's just sort of reeling under those hammer blows? Well, if she is willing, I'll speak to the husband, 
if that wife is willing to see that she's in the wrong, oftentimes a wife in that situation just points the finger at her husband. If he were respectable, I would respect him. Yeah. If, you know, if That's he'd let point. me help him, I would help him. Yeah. It's all his fault. She needs an older woman, 10 to 15 years down the road. Uh, church leaders, look for those women. I know in Acts 29 we don't have many. We're a younger church. But uh, an older woman, and if not uh, in actual years, then in years with the Lord, who can bring her to Scripture and say, your marriage is worth saving. Your marriage is a social platform on which your kids, your neighbors, your church, your country sees Christ and the church portrayed. You don't want to blow it. Mm. You know something you said once that I'd never thought of, and I thought this was so insightful, um, that when the Bible says a wife should respect her husband, that respect is not something that he has to earn before she gives it. It's a gift she gives up front by her own choice. That's really important for Did us Did I say that? Absolutely, yes. You say it your way, it's better. No, that was how I said it. Because how many of us wives would, have, would want to have to earn our husband's love? You know, and, Ephesians, and Ray's going to teach on that. The, the wife is to respect the husband, but the husband is to love her. And so respect is a gift we, we offer to our husbands. Not because they deserve it, but because that's how it works. God yeah. says, respect yeah. your husband. Oh, it'll be wonderful. That's how the marriage works. Yeah. Husbands, love your wives. That's how yeah. it works. So if you have, husbands, if you have a wife, husband, if you have a wife who does not respect you or is struggling, maybe you can go to the pastor. Maybe he can suggest a woman. Maybe you can get together as a couple. Wife, if you're having a hard time respecting your husband, then you need help from Jesus and get with another woman who will bring you to the word who won't sympathize with you say, oh you're so right you married such a loser <laughs> get with a woman who will tell you the truth about life about Jesus and about marriage and about the glory of pressing through the hard times yeah 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 how much how much does a wife have to do before her husband is going to agree to love her what does a husband have to do before his wife will agree that she's going to respect him? Are the, is that? Is, is, do we go into negotiations? That's not romance. You hurl yourself into it, giving all before. It's all going to play out. That's marriage. That crazy pre-commitment that marriage is saves us from our selfish caution mm -hmm. and fear. I was not ready to get married at age 22, but I needed to get married. God had mercy on me. <laughs> I was so immature. I mean, I'm embarrassed as I look back on it. But the only way I was going to grow up is to have this precious wife respect me before I deserved it. You know, I might add here, Jeff, before that next question is, tomorrow we're going to hit a point from Romans 7 on mm, grace, and law. grace and law. And we're going to ask yeah. ourselves, you know, is your husband, dear woman, is he married to Mrs. Law or Mrs. Grace? And we're going to talk that through. That will apply to this question. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah. How do you recommend handling finances when one spouse is not financially responsible? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I love spending money. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is serious. Well, that's what we have it for, to spend it. Jenny walks into a store, clothing, for example, she has this uncanny ability to zoom, go right for this incredible bargain right over there, and it works for her and so forth. I don't, you're amazing. 
I walk in, you know, I walk into Bass Pro Shop or whatever it is, and I go zoom toward the most expensive thing, and I don't care. <laughs> this. So Janie handles the finances. I seriously, I mean, I really appreciate Janie's care and diligence and attention to detail. It's a stewardship. It really matters. How we handle money is a matter of character. It's addressed in the Bible. And, you know, I'm predisposed. Janie is more predisposed to be fearful. Money doesn't scare me. I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not worried about our future financially. I probably should be more than I am. It just doesn't bother me. Janie thinks about it. So I tend to be reckless. She tends to be overcautious between the two of us. We're learning through the years how to put it together. She's a blessing to me. Her influence is really good for me. It's not money that scares me. It's the lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps showing up, babe. I would say, you know, there's, when we were in seminary, um, Prof. Hendricks taught us that there are three things that ruin marriages, that people divorce over. Sex, in-laws, and money. Money is one of the three huge things that, that couples fight over. So there are ways you can work that out. There are classes you can take. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and you do want to be good stewards of your money. So it, it, the question is, if one is one way, I just think that's a great way to look up financial peace, institution, whatever. I'm not here to plug Dave in. Dave Ramsey. Thing. Yeah. You know, and here's, this is very, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I finished. Okay. Um, that, the, the crisis du jour, the emergency that's really pressing on you right now, 30 years from now, it's probably not going to matter very much. Yes. That's For so all good. the things we've been talking about, guys, marriage is a lifelong relationship. Don't let the crisis of the hour torpedo your lifelong intimacy. Janie and I have had so many misfires along the way, and honestly, we can't even remember most of them. We don't even care. I, I don't, I've got her. We've got 43 years under our belt. Yeah. And they get sweeter. Every yes. year gets sweeter. I'll yeah. just add this little story here about finances. One of the reasons I didn't want to go overseas for Ray's PhD was the money issue. And so we had to come to the point where we said we'd sell our house. We sold everything. Um, we just moved in our two suitcases each. There were five of us, so we had 10 suitcases. We saved Ray's library and my piano, but everything else, car, house, furniture, appliances, everything was sold and invested for our four-year program there. Ray couldn't work. He was on a student visa. Two years into the program, I gave birth to our fourth child, and our investor went belly up. And we lost every penny. Yeah, we were so broke, we couldn't even quit and fly home. And, and to me, it was a crisis. God used that. God used that financial crisis. And look at us. We're clothed in our right minds. We have four married children who all went to college. We don't, we're out of debt, except our home. We owe a little bit on our home. So... God used that financial crisis to bring me closer to him. Yeah. Don't let money, a money issue, separate you from God or your spouse. It's not worth it. Yeah. Rather, I'd be broke with this man than a millionaire without him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> Okay, let's kind of change gears just a little. How should a couple handle theological differences in a marriage? From anywhere, from the doctrines of grace to end times, etc. Yeah. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 says that the gospel itself is of first importance. Mm -hmm. Namely... Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried. He was raised again according to the scripture. Jesus, crucified, buried, risen again. That heart and soul and center of the gospel is of first importance. The Bible itself says so. The Bible itself says not everything is of first importance. 
But Jesus, our Savior, crucified, buried, risen again, is of first importance. Um, if, if you're married to a Christian person who loves Jesus because he died, was buried, and rose again, you're good to go. Everything else is secondary. And you don't build a great marriage on secondary issues. <laughs> you build a great marriage on Jesus. So if you're not agreed, Janie and I, Janie grew up Baptist, I grew up Presbyterian. I, I baptized babies. That's not what they did in the Baptist church. So it's like, <laughs> is that Roman Catholic? my baby? <laughs> what will my mom say? Yeah. <laughs> That's a secondary issue, y'all. It's not of first importance. And you don't build a great marriage by arm wrestling your wife into agreement over infant baptism. I don't think that's why she married you. And your kids don't need to see you arguing about theology. They need to see you loving Jesus and rejoicing in him. Yeah. I'm in a, well, I'm not in a relationship. This, this question <laughs> is... <laughs> I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend, and what boundary... <laughs> I knew it was going south right when I started. I'm in a relationship with my boyfriend, so what boundary should I set that only a husband should have access to, of course, aside from sex? My word of caution is... Um, Let's say, okay, you're in this relationship. Let's say, unfortunately, something happens to that man. What, how can I word this the best way? What wouldn't you want any other man to know about you? When uh, you're not married until you're married. And so you want to save certain things about yourself until you're married. There are certain things that only Ray knows about me. I don't want to give those away to other men. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you want to be very careful. What if you don't get married? Don't give away anything that would ruin marriage to another man. Yeah. Or even just complicate it. Or complicate it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to import into the future? You need to think about that. Last one for, for the evening. This person said it's a longer one. I'm enjoying our discussion on cherish, cherishing your husband and wife and pursuing one flesh. I'm thinking of women who are not married or whose husbands have died. How do we see our identity as women as distinct from our role as wives? Do we only understand our identity in relation to our husbands or men? Yeah. Well, as profound as one flesh is, it is not the most profound human relationship. To be one spirit with the Lord is infinitely more profound. See, your spouse still doesn't know everything about you. But the Lord does. And he does not shame you. And he will love you and accept you and rejoice over you eternally. Yes. There's your identity. Psalm 62, 1. And then if your heart has been broken through bereavement and widowhood, in, at one level, of course, your heart was broken because a man was taken from you who was dear to you and precious to you. But at the same time, at another level, that was also the Lord's reinvestment in you. He gave you the gift of a broken heart so that you understand what it means to live with a broken heart. And all around you are people with broken hearts. Now, you are able to care for them, understand them, love them, listen to them, be patient with them. Other people might be glib, they might be shallow. They might even be cruel in their incomprehension. You're not going to be like that. You're going to be a true friend. That's a gift. 
Does that seem okay? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh, thank you guys so much. This is wonderful. I got, I'm so glad I got to stand right here and just have a front row seat to your wisdom. Guys, we <laughs> thanks, guys. show your thanks for Ray and Jamie.